What's up guys, we're back with another educational video and this week we're talking about training. Load versus reps. But first, like, subscribe, you know the drill. Algorithm comments, let's go. Really cool new study just came out. I saw it on Twitter as where I consume most of my information, probably why I'm so screwed up, about resistance training. It's tweeted out by Brad Schoenfeld, so shout out to him. If you guys don't follow him, definitely recommend it. Top hypertrophy researcher in the world. He's a great follow on Twitter, Instagram, all that kind of stuff. I do not get a referral fee for sending people to Brad. He's just an awesome guy and does great research. Giving you guys a little bit of backstory, probably 20 years ago when I got into training, one of the common themes was there were strength rep ranges, hypertrophy rep ranges, and endurance rep ranges. Strength rep range is like five reps and lower. A hypertrophy rep range is like six to 15 reps. And then an endurance rep range is like 15 reps and over. And over the years, many studies have been conducted that have kind of led us to the consensus now where we've said, eh, that model is not completely wrong, but it's mostly wrong. We do know that from like a couple reps to 30 reps, essentially, as long as you're taking the set close to failure, as long as you equate the number of hard sets and the effort is similar, and when I say effort, again, I mean proximity to failure, the hypertrophy responses are very similar. And so it looks like there's just many ways to skin a cat when it comes to reps. Strength particularly does appear to be better with lower rep sets, probably because strength is a specific skill. And endurance does appear to be possibly a little bit better when you're doing higher reps. But in terms of the muscular hypertrophy response, it appears to be very similar from low reps to 30 reps. If you get much over 30 reps, it just gets really hard to approach fatigue because the load is so light. So there is a limit to it. But if you go from low reps to 30 reps, somewhere around there, it appears that if you do a hard enough set and you equate the number of hard sets, you get very similar hypertrophy outcomes. So to that end, one of the things that's a big tenant for muscular growth, and you hear this all the time, is progressive overload. How do you continue to induce growth? Well, you have to progressive overload. You hear people say this all the time. And people get really hung up on the load part of that word of progressive overload. But overload doesn't necessarily mean the actual load itself. It can also refer to the number of repetitions, the volume, the number of hard sets. So a recent study looked at taking resistance trained individuals, they had men and women, they've looked at it separately and they didn't see different results, so they combined them together. But they looked at men and women who'd been resistance training for at least a year consistently. And they put them into two different lower body resistance training programs where they did back squats, leg extensions, and calf raises. At the beginning, they standardized them by testing their 10 rep maximums. And then they put them into two groups, a group that either attempted to progress load or a group that attempted to progress reps. So they equated the number of hard sets, which is really important as we talked about, and they equated the effort because they had the groups take each set to failure. In both groups, they started out doing eight to 12 reps for each set. But in the load group, they had them stay within that rep range and just increase the load as they got better at it. Whereas in the reps group, they had them increase the number of reps, but keep the load the same as the beginning. It was an eight week study and at the end, they had to measure quite a few different variables like muscle thickness as measured by ultrasound. They had them look at strength as assessed by a Smith machine squat. They had them do repetitions to fatigue, I believe on a leg extension. They looked at counter movement jump, which is basically just a, a freestanding jump. They also looked at uh, body fat percentage and lean mass. So they measured a few different variables. And I really feel like they did a great job designing this study. One, because they equated the number of hard sets. Two, because they equated the effort. Three, they made sure they took all measurements at least 48 hours after the last resistance training session, which is really important because you can have muscle damage, which induces swelling, and that can affect the measurements of hypertrophy and muscle thickness. And four, they blinded the researchers doing the analysis of the data. Now, it wasn't possible to blind the participants because you had to tell them to either increase reps or increase load, and it also was not possible to blind the researchers who were doing the actual strength testing because they needed to know which group they were in. But other than that, I thought they did a really nice job designing the study, it was very elegant. Now, the one ding on it you can make is it was only eight weeks. Is it possible there could have been different results over a longer period of time? Yes, it's always possible. 
but I think for the constraints they had, they did a really great job. What were the outcomes? They really didn't see big differences in any measures of hypertrophy except in the rectus femoris, which is your hamstrings. The rectus femoris actually had a little bit more growth in the reps group. And the researchers really didn't have a great way to explain this. They speculated on what may have happened, which I actually think was a decent hypothesis, which was in the reps group, they're having a lot more fatigue during a back squat and their quadriceps are becoming much more fatigued. And it may be that the rectus femoris took over a little bit of that to help them complete the reps. Is that the real reason it happened? Who knows? But it could be a reason why they saw these small differences in rectus femoris muscle thickness. Now they didn't see a difference in quad thickness or anything like that. And so does this mean that progressing reps is better than progressing load overall? I would say no, only from the perspective that they weren't doing any hamstring specific exercises. And so it's possible if they were including that, that they would not have seen a difference in rectus femoris thickness. But again, they had very tight constraints. And the more you add into a study, the more probability there is to induce uh, unknown errors that you can't foresee. So I thought they did a really great job. What was interesting is strength favored the load group a little bit. So they had a little bit better strength increase in the back squat with the load group and then endurance slightly favored the reps group. So not necessarily a surprising finding based on what we already know. Now, I would say that I think these differences would become more exacerbated if the study duration was longer. Again, eight weeks is usually not enough time to see really big differences. So even though they were small differences, I think they might've been bigger over time, but it's hard to know without the research. All the other stuff really wasn't different. And so my takeaway from this is once again, it appears that there's many ways to skin a cat. If you prefer to try to progress load, progress load. If you prefer to try to progress reps, progress reps. There's also no reason you can't do both. So you can pick specific exercises where you're trying to progress load and specific exercises where you're trying to progress reps. I know with a lot of our programming we do for the workout builder, we'll really focus on trying to progress load in the big compound movements only because those movements become so fatiguing when you're trying to do high reps that form can suffer and quite frankly, if you've ever done a back squat for 15 reps doing it properly, your lungs give out before your quads do in many cases. We save the higher rep progressions for exercises that are more isolation, like leg extension, leg curl, those sorts of things. Not saying that's the only way to do it, but we've just found that that is a nice balance between the two. And hey, if there's different adaptations to both, why not get the benefits of both? So I think what this study really says is, again, many ways to skin a cat and why not get the benefits of doing both? They don't have to be mutually exclusive. Guys, if you like the video and you like these research breakdowns and you need help with programming, check out the subscription-based services we have on the BioLane website. You can sign up to the Workout Builder and Reps and it's only 20 bucks a month. The Workout Builder gives you access to all our evidence-based programming where you can get the benefits of progressing load and progressing reps like we just talked about. And it takes out the guesswork in terms of reps, sets, intensity. And you can choose exercises that you have access to based on what your gym has. Or if you're training from home, we have options for that as well. And you can also pick exercises that you prefer compared to things you don't prefer. When you sign up for reps, you get access to some of the best research breakdowns. So you don't have to be guessing about what a study actually says. We take care of it break it down for you in plain language, and you can get both of those services for $19.99 a month. It's hard to beat, so click the link in the description, go sign up for those, and I'll catch you next week.